Welcome to EPG Patshala for the course on History and Ideologies of Social Work. My name is Murli Desai and I'm a former professor from Tata Institute of Social Sciences. Today's topic is Ideologies of Neocolonialism, Neoliberalism and Post-Democracy. These are the three ideologies that we will look at and the linkages across. Okay, let us first start by looking at the context of decolonization. In the wake of the upheavals of the First World War, the stability of the empire was undermined as colonial resources and personnel were used in the war. The notion of eventual decolonization came to be accepted by the colonial powers. There was a slow movement away from the colonial ideologies towards the ideas of freedom. The Second World War brought unparalleled levels of death, devastation, privation and disorder. It left not only much of Europe and Asia in ruins, but the old international order was also disturbed. It was these greater upheavals of the Second World War that led to decolonization. Now, what is important to know after decolonization is the phenomenon of the Cold War. Let's see what that means and how that happened. As the Second World War moved to, into its final phase, the United States of America, which we will call the US, and the Soviet Union held most of the military, economic, and diplomatic power. For most US civilians, the war meant not suffering and privation, but prosperity because it's, it's their military products that were being used in the war by both the parties. From the war, the US emerged, therefore, as the most powerful nation in the world. The US planners viewed the establishment of a freer and more open international economic system as indispensable to this new order. However, Soviet Union, three times larger than the US, was number one problem for the US. Soviets and Americans each saw themselves acting out of noble motives with mirror opposite ideological values. We know the United States is classically liberalistic and Soviet Union is based on the socialistic ideologies. The widespread conflict between the two, later known as the Cold War, which lasted from 1947 to 1991, when the Soviet Union dissolved, divided the world as follows. The first world comprised the industrialized democracies of Europe and North America, plus Australia, New Zealand and Japan, but represented by the US. The second world comprised the communist countries of Eastern Europe and their ideological allies in Asia and Cuba, represented by the Soviet Union. The third world comprised the remaining countries, most of which were former colonies, then decolonized. Now, what happened with reference to these former colonies that were decolonized? who faced neocolonialism. Independence of the former colonies very often involved a transfer of power not to the people of the newly sovereign country, but to local elites who inherited the whole colonial system of the army, the police, the judiciary and the law, government bureaucracy and so on. This sovereignty even for the elite did not give total freedom to the governments because it was decolonization was only a relatively minor move from direct to indirect rule by the western countries through neocolonialism. Those subtle and indirect forms of domination had as a root cause the econo economies bequeathed by the colonial powers at the time of constitutional independence. The new rulers of the former colonies 
found that the major proportion of the resources available to them was controlled from metropolitan centers of the first world countries that hitherto had ruled their countries directly. Development aid has been the main form or instrument for neo-colonialism. Let us see what development aid is all about. During the Cold War, the US provided military aid to the newly independent countries to fight civil wars with their own people to combat communism. For example, Taiwan with China, South Korea with North Korea, and South Vietnam with North Vietnam. As its anti-communist allies, the US also provided them with economic aid. In the beginning, this aid was untied. That is, there was no requirement that the aid may be sent on, spent on US goods. However, towards the end of the 1950s, the practice of tied aid grew. The US instituted bilateral aid programs which served both to redistribute dollars which enable other countries to buy US exports and to purchase military, political and economic advantages around the world from the US. In 1961, the US Agency for International Development was established to unify the already existing U.S. aid efforts. Aid tying by the U.S. eventually resulted in the European and the Japanese countries for adopting this practice. Now, the International Monetary Fund started playing a role in development aid as a proxy to the U.S. Uh, the IMF, as is quite uh, well known, was given a key role to play in this tied aid strategy. In their pursuit of development, the developing countries began to request borrowings from the IMF. The issue of which country should be recipients of the aid was subject primarily to political and ideological considerations, not developmental. The IMF pressed the aid receiving countries to liberalize their trade and payments. Its philosophy called for the widest possible freedom of play for market forces. It therefore frowned on many kinds of government interventions such as price subsidies, rationing, or protection of domestic industries as distortions of free market relations. What were the implications of such tied aid? The IMF strategy resulted in the takeover of the domestically owned businesses by their foreign competitors and devaluation raised the cost of living. Developing countries found that the IMF ordered them like debt slaves as their debt kept them tied to their creditors. If they remained within the system, the debtor countries were doomed to perpetual underdevelopment or rather to development of their exports at the service of multinational enterprises, at the expense of development for the needs of their own citizens. Now, let us understand the trend towards neoliberalism, which is only an extension of the neocolonialism that we just discussed. The third world debt crisis that we briefly discussed a while ago of the late 1970s was followed by the Reagan-Thatcher era of the 1980s that promoted the ideology of neoliberalism. As the so Soviet Union dissolved in 1989, the Cold War and the existence of the Second World ended. The US remained a lone superpower and henceforth it became more difficult to envisage alternatives to capitalism. In this era of neoliberal backlash, the World Bank and the IMF argued that the debt crisis had been a result of the inward-oriented status development strategies of the 1950s and 1960s. What they emphasized under this term neoliberalism was minimum government interference and considering market as the sole social and economic regulator. 
In the sphere of economics, globalization is reflected in the increasing acceptance of free markets and private enterprise as the principal mechanisms for promoting economic activities. The World Bank and the IMF promoted the Structural Adjustment Program through which the developing countries were made as a condition to loans to cut what was regarded as excessive public spending, to balance their books and enable the development of their private economies, often through a strategy of export-led growth. Following are the components of this process of globalization. One, the world's money, technology and markets are controlled and managed by gigantic global corporations. A common consumer culture unifies all people in a shared quest for material gratification. As we've discussed earlier, this, was, this had its base in individualism. Corporations are free to act solely on the basis of profitability without regard to national or local consequences. Relationships, both individual and corporate, are defined entirely by the market. There are no loyalties to place and community. All these are part of this whole concept of neoliberalism, which is total freedom and market as a sole regulator. Nothing else matters. As a result of, this, of such neoliberal globalization, the global economy arranges its global operations to produce products where costs are the lowest, sells them where markets are most lucrative, and shifts the resulting profits to where tax rates are least burdensome. What are the implications of such globalization? It led to destabilization of governments because governments were marginalized, secular hierarchies, the empowerment of people, increase in poverty, reduction of welfare, emergence of the global middle class, civil wars, newly industrialized countries, anti-globalization protests, terrorism, and American financial crisis affecting the whole world. Let us take each one of these now. Destabilization of governments. In smaller nation states, the multinational corporations play the nefarious game of destabilizing the state systems, which had hardly settled after decolonization. Removing any obstruction through consp conspiracy and even calculated political intervention. In most of the third world countries, democratic institutions were superseded by dictatorships, which are at the mercy and under the command of the global capitalist forces. Development became denationalized as globalization made became development without nations. This weakened the bargaining power of any given locality and shifted the balance of power from the local human interest to the global corporations. It weakened the community to free the market. It eliminated livelihoods to create wealth and it destroyed life to create to increased unneeded and often unsatisfying consumption. Disempowerment of people. The most distinguishing feature of the global political economy is that people everywhere are pitched against a centralized system, which has assumed an identity independent of the people. The domination of Western science and technology has swept away diverse and valuable knowledge systems and technologies based on centuries of experience. Capital-intensive technologies are systematically treated as superior to traditional labor-intensive technologies, resulting in unemployment and indebtedness. Poverty increased because number of billionaires grew. More and more people around the f people found themselves in a system that offered them no place in production and no access to consumption, even to meet their basic needs. Globalization furthers the uninterrupted flow of resources from the third world and thus aggravates the present unjust international economic order. 
the old poor are joined by the new poor, that is the newly unemployed middle class household, middle income household. Welfare was reduced. Households that are expected to receive state assistance formed themselves made vulnerable as state-citizen relationship was redefined. Middle class citizens who had previously received services were told that they were no longer entitled to these benefits or entitled only if they could afford to pay for those provided on a cost recovery basis. The lower income groups, many of whom had never received such benefits, continued to be ignored. Civil wars emerged within nations due to resurgence of religious fundamentalism and ethnic conflicts. These conflicts take place on account of a sense of insecurity, frustration, feeling of injustice and deepening disparities as a result of neocolonialism and neoliberalism and globalization. The concept of security had ceased to be national or territorial in nature and increasingly being replaced by human security that involves issues of people's well-being, social and political stability based upon meeting their basic needs, peace, human rights and environmental balance. The Muslim world charged the capitalist system seeking to turn the entire world into a fiefdom of the major corporations under the label of globalization. In 2001, the radical Al-Qaeda attacked the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center, which were the symbol of the world's most neoliberal society. The neoliberalists took this opportunity to extend the hegemony of neoliberalism as the civilized forces, as against the uncivilized terrorists generally from the Islamic world. Some other implications of globalization one of which was emergence of the global middle class. Globalization led to the formation of a global middle class of consumers. The competitive struggle of the global middle classes for a greater share of income and power is often being carried out at the expense of the fundamental rights of the poor and the powerless. Globalization also led to newly industrialized countries, especially in Asia. In a rapid advance, they, the newly industrializing countries acquired a larger share of economic activity. People were not totally quiet to all these negative implications. Millions of people around the world rejected the neoliberal dream of a single global market fueled by ceaseless consumerist desires. Massive protests took place in the Western countries against the widening global inequalities due to the neoliberal trade and development agenda of IMF and World Trade Organization. The anti-liberal protesters successfully coalesced into a sizable global justice movement that established the World Social Forum. The last and major event which was the result of the neoliberal globalization was the American financial crisis of 2007. At that time, the United States went through a liquidity shortfall in the banking system. It resulted in the collapse of large financial institutions, the bailout of banks by national governments and downturns in stock markets all over the world. It is considered by many economists to be the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression of the 1930s. It contributed to the failure of key businesses, declines in consumer wealth estimated in trillions of US dollars, substantial financial commitments incurred by governments, and a significant denial decline in economic activity. Neoliberalism was criticized and arguments were made in favor of greater regulatory oversight by national and global institutions. Now let us look at the last ideology in today's module of which is called the post-democracy. With liberalization, privatization and globalization, more and more countries are getting democratized in the liberal manner. 
under the US influence, liberal democracy stresses, electoral participation, extensive freedom for lobbying activities, which mainly means business lobbies, and a form of polity that avoids interfering with a capitalist economy. We have seen the concept of democracy the way it first started with all the ideas of people's participation through associations. But today the liberal democracy has boiled down to these three basic aspects. This model of democracy has little interest in widespread citizen involvement or the role of organization outside of the business sector. Following have been the implications of such liberal democracy. Representative democracy has led to the rise of an oligarchy whose leaders have interests that differ from those of the ordinary citizens whom they represent. The state becomes a policeman, an incarcerator. The wealth gap between the rich and the poor grows. Taxation becomes less redistributive. Politicians respond primarily to the concern of a handful of business leaders whose special interests are allowed to be translated into public policy. The poor gradually cease to take any interest in the process whatsoever and do not even vote, returning voluntarily to the position they were forced to occupy in the pre-democratic times. Post-democracy has emerged with disillusionment with democracy as powerful minority interests have become far more active than the mass of ordinary people. Political elites have learned to manage and manipulate popular demands. People have to be persuaded to vote by top-down publicity campaigns and so on. Now what is post-democracy if democracy has not worked? Post-democracy goes beyond the idea of democracy as people's rule and challenges the idea of rule at all. This is reflected in the collapse of deference to government, the insistence of total openness by the government, the reduction of politicians to something more resembling shopkeepers than rulers, anxiously seeking to discover what their customers want in order to stay in business. This is a concept, this is an ideal, but yet to see post-democracy really being practiced anywhere in the world. To summarize today's module, we analyze the ideology of neocolonialism through tied development aid that replaced the direct colonial rule after the former colonies achieved independence. We examine the transition from the ideology of liberalism to neoliberalism that comprises minimum government interference and considers market as a sole regulator. We reviewed the implications of the neoliberal globalization with reference to destabilization of governments, disempowerment of people, increase in poverty, civil wars, terrorism, etc. Finally, we examined the emergence of post-democracy with the illusionment, disillusionment with democracy as powerful minority interests have become far more active in the mass of ordinary people. You will see a lot of relevance of what we have discussed today with our contemporary socio-political situation. And this is what should be discussed by students in small groups and um, applied in the field situation. We can see the disillusionment with democracy in our own country in contemporary times. We see that people have to be persuaded to vote. We see that people's opinions are not considered important in policy formulation. Even the civil society consultations which were prevalent earlier are now being discouraged. The powerful minority political interest is what drives the public policies and not what the masses want. At the same time, the political elites manipulate popular demands. They make these policies appear as if they are in support of the masses. People in India are largely disillusioned with 
democracy itself, the way it is being practiced in India, compared to the ideal of democracy, where the underlying theme was people's participation. So what would people of India want? Would they like post-democracy? What is post-democracy? It is an idea which goes beyond democracy because it doesn't believe in rule at all. If democracy means people's rule, then post-democracy challenges rules at all. Why should anyone rule, even the people? So, government doesn't become the powerful um, know-all, do-all kind of an entity. The deference to government has to come down. Total transparency by the government has to be insisted upon. And politicians have to work like shopkeepers in the post-democratic ideology, where they anxiously seek for customers who want needs met. You want an Aadhaar card? You go to the shopkeeper, get your Aadhaar card. Not wait in long lines, not wait for the red tapism that has arrived or not be given services as a favor. People have a right to these services and government provides these rights in the most efficient manner. This is a vision of post-democracy, which provides hopes for the people, which we have yet to achieve. Thank you very much.